All right, welcome back to another episode of Audio Electronics here. This time we're going to talk about making the actual connection between two audio devices, or two or more in this case. So what do we need to do to start thinking about that? Well, instead of just plugging things together randomly, uh, there are a few things that you may want to check out first. Um, first thing we want to do is check out the source and load impedances, uh, because the impedances have to be within a certain range of each other to uh, properly transmit the signal from one device to the other. Uh, of course, we also have to worry about whether the system is balanced or unbalanced going from one device to another. Is it a balanced output? Is it a balanced input or unbalanced and vice versa? And uh, what about levels? Um, is it outputting a much higher level than the other uh, is expecting to see? Is it put outputting too low? So are you overloading the input of the following device or is it not driving it hardly enough? So Really, we're talking about impedance, balance, and level. Three things that you should always check out when connecting things together. So first up is impedance, uh, which is basically, uh, you know, long story short, is going to be the AC version of resistance uh, because it is frequency dependent. Uh, you will see typically see specifications on devices that will give you a fixed uh, impedance amount, um, and it may be constant across the entire frequency range. It may have some variations. Um, but uh, just know that it isn't necessarily static from um, from one frequency range to the other. Now, luckily, in our world of pro audio, uh, devices that are designed to be used in studio systems or live sound reinforcement, things like that, are generally designed to work with each other, and they've kind of figured this whole impedance thing out a long time ago. And they've pretty much standardized on the fact that low impedance outputs feed high impedance inputs, and that generally works pretty well. Um, now, what does it mean by low versus high? Well, the low should be 10 times less than the high, or vice versa, said the other way. The input impedance should be at least 10 times greater than the output impedance. And as you can see here, for example, if uh, a source impedance uh, has an output impedance of rated at 200 ohms, you should look for the following device to have an input impedance of greater than 2 kilo ohms, of at least 10 times the output impedance of the device that's feeding it. Now, one way to look at this is sort of like water distribution, if you will. Um, a low impedance output can be seen as like the big pipe or the water main that feeds a whole neighborhood for uh, a whole neighborhood's water supply pipes. Okay, so the big pipe carries a whole bunch of water, and a whole bunch of smaller pipes can tap onto that, because the big, big pipe has the capability to supply all of the little pipes. Uh, just in the same way, if you had a really small pipe, like a garden hose, you wouldn't be able to feed a whole lot of uh, outputs from that uh, without the voltage, uh, or in this case, you know, the water pressure really suffering. Uh, for example, if you have a small garden hose and you attach one sprinkler to it to water your lawn, uh, you know, it works okay. But if you add uh, like a little splitter on the end of it and add, you know, two, three, four sprinkler heads on the end of that single garden hose, it doesn't really work too well. You know, the, the water doesn't come out very high. It's kind of just doesn't work. Um, it's kind of the same way uh, with the water pressure with voltages. You know, the more, if you have a high impedance output, it can't really fill up all of the big pipes, as it were, of the low impedance um, sort of thing. So, so that's, that's one way to look at it as, because we want that big pipe to be able to feed all sorts of other uh, smaller pipes. You know, in this case, uh, one output signal could feed multiple input signals. So that's why you can take one audio device output and just simply using Y cables, you can feed multiple destinations. And again, just to clarify, we don't match impedances in case you've ever heard that terminology. We bridge impedance. We bridge the gap between a lower output impedance and a high input impedance. So why are we bridging impedance instead of matching? Well, for one, there's smaller output current needs, so there's less distortion, there's less uh, current draw out of the device. Um, <clears throat> These smaller currents also reduce inductive coupling and crosstalk between the cables, since we're not talking about uh, greater currents, so it's uh, less of an EMI and whatnot. And as I just mentioned, many devices can be fed from one single output. And this is taken from uh, Philip Giddings' book, Audio Systems Design and Installation, which is a, which is a really great reference manual for um, 
really digging into the depths of this because we're just simply scratching the surface. And again, with impedance matching, we're maximizing power transfer. But what we really want with our signals is the voltage transfer. We want the integrity of that signal voltage uh, to be transferred from device to device because we're not really concerned with power. We just want the integrity of that signal, which is the voltage. And here are some typical impedances that you might see. Again, this is from uh, Philip Gidding's book. So let's talk about some impedances in a, uh, a very basic signal chain. Uh, let's take it from a microphone to a preamplifier, um, a mic pre that is, and then to a uh, compressor. So we'll, we'll just quickly follow that signal chain and show you where to look for the impedances. Now this is our favorite SM58 world standard vocal mic. I'm um, looking at the spec sheet here. It says impedances. Rated input impedance is 150 ohms, 300 ohms actual for connection to microphone inputs rated low impedance. Um, so here what we're going to do is so now this tells us that you know, just to be safe we're going to look for a mic input that uh, yeah, a what, what we call a low impedance mic input of a mixer or in this case a mic pre uh, that will be 10 times greater than this output impedance. So that input impedance should be 10 times greater than this output impedance. In this case, we're looking at 300 ohms, actual, and so we're going to look at uh, 3000 ohms as the input impedance of the next device. So let's see what we get here. Now we're going to take a look at this Behringer Mic Pre, which uh, for the microphone audio input section, scroll down here, let's see, impedance, oh, 3000 ohms, balanced impedance. Great, so that's 10 times greater than the SM58's output impedance, so that will easily work. That's great. Now let's see what the output impedance is here, which is 60 ohms, and let's see how that translates if we were to take the output of this mic pre into, say, this uh, RAIN dynamics processor, or compressor, if you will. So here, let's scroll and see the inputs. Balance, blah, blah, impedance, 20,000 ohms. Okay, so the input impedance is 20,000 ohms, so it can very easily take the output impedance of this guy, which is only 60 ohms. So it's definitely greater than 10 times the output impedance. So we're, we're perfectly fine here. So, you know, again, these values can vary. If we go back to the chart, um, your low Z mic could be anywhere, you know, around 150 ohms to 300 ohms. Some other tube mics may vary uh, quite greatly. But um, <clears throat> in the voltage source system, uh, this is an another name for simply um, you know, low Z outputs and whatnot. So you may see voltage source as a terminology or low Z or low impedance. So any of these are generally about the same thing. So as you can see here, uh, output impedance is in the range of 200 or 60, and then the typical input impedances are in the 10,000s of the ohms, just to give you that little bit of a comparison. Whereas microphone inputs here are 1.5 K to 4 kilo ohms as a typical uh, input impedance. Now the next thing we're going to talk about is balance. Um, as you'll see that most of our devices will have balanced outputs, although sometimes there will be unbalanced inputs or outputs in our pro audio systems, uh, especially in project studio situations. So what exactly is it and how do we deal with it? Well, first it's helpful to define exactly what a balanced interface is so that we kind of know what we're dealing with. Um, of course, you can pause the video and read this uh, as much as you like, so I'll just kind of uh, give you the broad overview. But basically, what a balanced interconnection is, is you have your positive and your negative conductors, whereas in an unbalanced uh, connection, you simply have a positive and a signal ground. Here you have the positive, negative, and a signal ground in the balanced interconnection. And the two uh, signal carrying conductors, the positive and the negative, uh, both are to have equal impedance with relation to ground, um, which is very important because that's really what allows a balanced interconnection to reject noise. And by having those equal impedances with respect to ground, that allows noise to be induced equally into each conductor, both the positive and the negative. And when the noise is equal in both conductors, because one is exactly the opposite polarity, uh, it can be canceled out. Let's see a quick uh, illustration of uh, what this really means. Well, here's a really great uh, picture I found on, oh, of all places, Wikipedia on the differential signaling 
uh, area. So go ahead and look it up, but I'll explain it for you because it's, uh, it's a pretty good diagram here. So basically, this is what we want to send. We want to send this signal across to this destination. All right, so this is the output. This is the input of the following device. And across here with a balanced interconnection, we have a positive and we have a negative, which as you can see is the inverse phase or invert, inverted polarity rather. So signals coming along. This one is uh, standard polarity. This is the invert polarity. These are going along and boop, somewhere along here we get some noise, which is bad. We don't want that. Well, what the resulting signal looks like if we add the noise to our original uh, signal here, it looks like this. The noise is added here and the noise is added to this signal. So here at the negative terminal here, this signal with the noise is inverted and will cancel out the noise that was added to here because in a, in a balanced interconnection we want the noise to be equally induced into both conductors. So if this is equally induced here in the negative conductor in the same way it is with the positive, then when this is inverted it will exactly cancel out the noise in the other conductor and which will result in a signal without noise. And that's how, in a, in a real quick nutshell, that a balanced interconnection can uh, reject noise. So now that we've talked about what a balanced connection is and how it works and how it rejects noise, um, let's talk a little bit about how to get them to play nice together with unbalanced systems. And it can be a little bit difficult, but basically, to make a long story short, you really want to make an unbalanced interconnection balanced by adding a transformer or some other circuitry to make it a balanced interconnection whenever you're interfacing an unbalanced device with a balanced device. And that's because unbalanced outputs and inputs use the signal ground differently than balanced interconnections do. In a balanced interface, the shield of the cable is really just that. It's sort of an extension of the metal chassis of each device. So if you have device A and device B, both with a metal chassis, kind of the functionality of the cable shield is to provide like an extension of that shield to cover the wires that are going between it. So you really only need the positive and negative signal carrying conductors in a balanced interconnection. That's why you can do a ground lift and you don't kill the signal. Now in an unbalanced interconnection, you simply have that one positive conductor and the signal ground as its reference. And if you lift the ground, we pretty much break the connection with the unbalanced uh, interconnection. So it's required in unbalanced, whereas it's not required in a balanced system. Now this adds a whole level of complexity which uh, can vary greatly between what exact type of balanced input or output it is, whether it's transformer or electrical or floating type of balanced input or output. So uh, the best place to look really is in uh, Rain's Rain Note 110 about sound system interconnection because there's so many variables in terms of connecting inputs and outputs together. Um, so if you check out that website, uh, check out their Rain Note 110 with the link given here. Uh, that's really the best place to look to see exactly how to connect your devices together if you are going to connect unbalanced and balanced devices together. So finally dealing with level. We want to make sure that we understand the four basic uh, groups of levels, if you will. Uh, the first being microphone level at around minus 60 dBU. Uh, next being instrument level, which is a little bit higher, but still fairly low in that minus 40 to minus 20 dBU range. And it can vary depending on the actual uh, device. And instrument level being electric and bass guitar outputs uh, or other uh, items with pickups, you know, say like a violin pickup or any kind of electric pickup, things like that. So the next up is line level, which is really the most common for what we're using in the studio. Because once we get a microphone through a preamp up to line level, that's really what we work with uh, when sending it to and from devices in the studio, you know, from a mixer to a compressor to an EQ, out to an amplifier. Uh, that's all going to be at line level. So that's really our operating level within the studio. Now with line level, you do have to worry about two different and very distinct operating levels. The first is plus 4 dBU, which is... Uh, what you'll see most often in professional recording studios and other pro audio equipment that's designated as such. Um, minus 10 dBV is a reference level 
mainly for consumer equipment and other uh, non-professional devices uh, meant for home use and things like that. So if you ever see a flip switch of sensitivity on an input, it'll say, oh, is this a plus 4 or minus 10? Uh, that's something you're going to want to check on each device to see what it is. Now, for example, this device here, our RAIN uh, compressor, will give us uh, a couple of different specs here. It will have either a plus 4 or a minus 10 dBV uh, sensitivity level. So that's, um, that's something that we would have to switch on the device itself, depending on what situation we're in. And 90% of the time, we're going to be at plus 4 dBU for our systems in a uh, recording studio uh, or a pro audio situation with other pro audio devices. And finally, speaker level, which obviously is the output of an amplifier to our loudspeakers or monitors, as the case may be. And that's going to be in that 30 dBU and up range. Now let's give an example of an application that uses all three of these things when, you're, when we're interfacing some devices. Uh, the DI box, of course. So if you're taking an electric guitar output and want to plug it right into a mixer, a mic input, well, we have to worry about a couple things. Of course, the uh, electric guitar output is uh, going to be a high impedance output, so we have to get it to be the kind of impedance that the mixing console wants to see. And it wants to see a, a much lower uh, input impedance. Because as we've saw on the chart before, most uh, mic input impedances are in the range of around uh, 2,000 ohms, you know, 2 kilo ohms in that range. So if we have something that is a 20,000 kilo ohm guitar output, uh, well, Obviously, it's uh, kind of the opposite of what we need. We'd really want that guitar output to be 10 times lower than the input impedance of that mixing console. In this case, the guitar output is 10 times higher, so it's really not going to work so well. You'll probably hear some weird distortion, the signal level wouldn't be right, and it would just generally not be a good thing. So the first thing that a DI box does is it will change that high impedance to a low impedance output. So next, it's going to balance that unbalanced signal out of our uh, instrument, which is going to be generally a tip sleeve, a TS quarter inch output cable, which is simply our signal and a ground. And here we're going to make it through the output of the DI box. It's going to be a mic type of output with a positive, negative, and ground, or positive, negative, and shield. And lastly, the DI box will change the level to the level appropriate to the following device. Since we're plugging it into a mic input of a mixing console, we have to drop it down slightly from that instrument or line level down to mic level. So here's a quick review for everything that we just discussed. Impedance. We want to make sure the input impedance is at least 10 times greater than the output impedance. We want to use balanced connections whenever possible. And if that's not possible, we'll use cable adapters only if there's no other option. And again, check out Rain Note 110 with the link shown here for a wonderful reference of all the different variations. And finally, we want to match level and reference levels. Is it mic level, instrument level, line level, or speaker level? And if it's line level, is it a plus 4 or minus 10 reference level? So check your impedance, check the balance, and check the level.